Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. We have another special guest this week in Matt Barry. Matt is an award-winning entrepreneur, technologist and lecturer, having won numerous awards, including being named the inaugural BRW Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011. He is now the founder and CEO of listed company Freelancer.com, which is one of the world's largest freelancing and crowdsourcing marketplaces. In today's interview, we discuss Matt's views on the Australian economy's house of cards, how we got into this situation, and some critical areas we need to address to help us get out of it. Through Freelancer.com's global reach, Matt also sits in the perfect position to provide some serious insight into current macroeconomic themes and some issues that confront emerging technology businesses in Australia today. After the interview, we'll then look at some of the wider investment implications that these themes can impact on how we invest money every day at Nucleus Wealth. So join Nucleus Wealth's Head of Investments, Damien Classen, Chief Strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith, and myself, Tim Fuller, as we dive into a fascinating hour with one of Australia's thought leaders of the new age. I hope you enjoy. So today on the podcast, we're very fortunate to have on the show award-winning entrepreneur, technologist and lecturer, and he's currently kept very busy as the CEO of Freelancer.com. Matt Barry, welcome to Nucleus Investment Insights. Thanks for having me. Uh, now, Matt, a big part of why we're excited to get you on the show today stems from a terrific piece you co-authored in late 2017 entitled House of Cards. Mm -hmm. And I think I would be correct in saying that popular media loves to focus on thought bubbles of successful and well-known people such as yourself. Uh, but what really struck a chord with us was that the House of Cards was anything that but a thought bubble. Um, so you covered off on themes such as world trade, quantitative easing, global monetary policy, government policy, the housing bubble, immigration, and our dire need to address innovation. Um, so I thought I might just start off by asking you, uh, what drove you to put together this essentially time of research and opinion back in 2017? Well, I guess coming from the perspective of the technology industry, I've I and many others in the industry have been continually frustrated by Australia's failure to really embrace the future, embrace technology, um, and really drive the economy forward. And, you know, I've, I've written um, in the past about technology policy, about various different angles and aspects, but um, it wasn't really until I started trying to address the fundamental issues that are facing Australia as a country and, and the economy as a whole, that, that everything started really coming together about why we can't move forward as a country and why that we are slowly sort of devolving into a developing world economy. Okay, sure. And and so, Matt, you know, I, I like to, um, you know, I, I like to sort of, I guess, pigeonhole the Australian, the Australian, the average Australian investor as somebody who wants to then actually go and, um, uh, you know, I want to go buy a house somewhere and, and do it up and then sell it to somebody or, or I want to go stick some money in the mine and, and make some money from it from that perspective, uh, which is very different, obviously, to the, to the, to the person who wants to, to start a technology company in, in, in the garage. Um, Australians seem to be very focused on that whole that whole property wealth thing. You know, do you, do you think we need a, a decent sized housing crash just to shake our shake that that from our psyche, from our national psyche? Well, I mean, if we, if we step back and just look at the economy of whole and kind of what do we do in this country? What 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 industries do we have? What do we produce? You know, where is Australia placed in terms of you know the global economy and and and, and the future? I mean, we've got a very 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 primitive economy. Um, you know, on one level, we um, ship iron ore overseas to China. Um, you know, we're the largest exporter of iron ore in the world. Um, it's about uh, thirty percent of uh, market share by volume and fifty percent by value, and eighty percent of that goes to China. And um, you know, in China, they consume it. Uh, half of that iron ore goes to uh, into into property, uh, and they're going through um, various uh, booms and busts of, of, of property speculation. Um, uh, you know, right now, iron ore is going pretty well for us, probably um, mainly because there's a supply disruption um, out of Brazil with with Vale. But um, you know, really, we just dig dirt out of the ground. We ship overseas. You know, the second biggest thing that we, we, we export is is coal and we do that to um, China and Japan. I mean, Japan's a temporary blip because of Fukushima and the nuclear reactors temporarily going offline. Um, uh, but, you know, that's all starting to come back online. Um, and, you know, naturally Japan usage of electricity is waning because the population is aging and actually declining and shrinking uh, in Japan. So net electricity um, generation is declining. Uh, China says that with coal that they want to match domestic demand with domestic supply and stop importing coal at some point. In fact, a few weeks ago, we had a, a bit of a scare in Australia where the Port of Dalian um, said that we will, they will no longer accept Australian coal. Um, 
Uh, and you know, a few days later, they said it was misunderstanding. But you know, the, the writing is in the wall, particularly for thermal coal, which is the coal that, um, uh, that um, we use to uh, burn for electricity. I mean, the UK had its first day burning um, uh, coal. Um, so the first day generating electricity without burning coal since the Industrial Revolution uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and then we've got you know, coal that was used for um, steel generation, uh, steel, steel manu uh, manufacturing, um, which is nearly tied to, you know, from our perspective, the, the Chinese property market, which kind of oscillates. Um, uh, you know, then the third biggest uh, thing we do in this country is we do um, education related travel services. I had no idea what that was and I had to kind of look into it. And it's basically immigration dressed up as education. And this is why we've got all those um, English um, colleges in the city and um, IT colleges that you know, producing graduates of the quality that no one really in the IT industry would really, really hire. They're really just um, colleges just designed to kind of skirt through the immigration uh, rules and get, and get people into the country because the federal government likes to uh, import people um, as a form of, uh, I guess, quantitative easing by um, growing the population by 11,000 or 12,000 people a month. They kind of drive a bit of uh, demand and um, pay some taxes and, 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 and so forth. But outside of that, we do very, very little. Um, you know, we used to be the 10th largest car uh, manufacturer in the world, and uh, we shut down the last plant, I think it was about a year ago, uh, for, for car manufacturing. Um, uh, I think it's only about, so manufacturing is about 6.6%, .6%, I think, of gross value add um, uh, in, in, in the country. Um, we do very, very, very little. Um, and, you know, in, in some industries like textiles, you know, in one year, we can lose 33% of all jobs like we did in textiles about two years ago. In fact, this month, the last Huggies plant shut down um, uh, and it's going to Asia. And, you know, um, now the, the manufacturing we're doing needs to be a lot more sophisticated and a lot more high, high end and more value add so we can you know, pay for the expensive wages that we have here. But effectively, we, we, we do very little in this country. And so what does the government do in terms of response um, uh, to deal with the fact that we don't really produce anything? We've got a very unsophisticated um, uh, economy and that, that blow a big housing bubble. And so... You know, the, you know, over the last um, decade, uh, probably you know, the mother of all bubbles has been blown, um, you know, which is a housing bubble on top of a China bubble on top of a, a, a commodities bubble. And um, that housing bubble is, is, is now popping. And, um, you know, the, the, the scale at which we, we, you know, we've blown this bubble, I mean, in, 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 according to I think called the, you know, the Ryder Leather Bucknell um, Crane Index, there were 735 cranes operating in the last quarter reported in Australia about 80% of them producing residential apartments and about 350 of them in Sydney. And to put that in context, in the top 14 North American markets combined, only um, there's only about 175 cranes, right? And that's in 14 markets. And this is a country with a population much, much mar larger than Australia. So, you know, we, we've been blowing this big housing bubble to create this false sense of wealth, um, you know, um, uh, and but in actual fact, we've also been uh, growing a massive debt bubble um, with households and that bubble is now popping. Um, and so we are in terrible strife um, at this point. Can I, can I ask you, Matt, um, it's David here. Um, undoubtedly, you're right about uh, the sort of pro-cyclical nature of government policy in terms of that hollowing out that you're describing. Uh, and we might, like, you know, traditionally that sort of thing has been called Dutch disease. I, I think we can uh, safely say that we've gone to something much more fatal and call it Australian disease. Uh, but I'm just wondering, have you actually had personal experience of how that might work in the market as well? Like, for instance, you know, various economists have, over the years have, have posited that it's difficult for, uh, you know, um, areas that aren't part of the resource endowment to attract capital and, and staff, etc., uh, and so these are kind of market dimensions that government policy, policy should be, you know, leaning against instead of, you know, putting a, a tailwind behind. Have you, have you actually come across that in your various sort of entrepreneurial pursuits? I have um, in, from various angles. From a, from a financing perspective, um, the good thing about having a technology company in Australia is you're you're some you're 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 a company that um, is in high demand from investors because there's not much to invest in, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the ASX, you know it is a very very large equity capital market. It's the same size as Nasdaq, it's, which is you know, the fourth largest equity capital market in the world, uh, but it's all in resources. Um, and outside of resources, there's very little to invest in. There's not much in the way. Well, and, and banks. Well, the bank, well, the interesting about well, the, the, well, the, well this, this this is the perverse thing about the Australian stock market is that the banks uh, plus Macquarie are about thirty percent 
of the ASX 200. And the perverse thing that's happening that, that continues to blow the property bubble is that every month, 9.5% of the Australian wage bill flows into superannuation. Of that superannuation, I think it's about 28% flows into equities, of which 30% in the ASX 200 are the bank stocks. So every month, you're kind of like pumping, pumping, pumping uh, uh, you know, the, the, the bank equity, which allows them to kind of you know, have, have large, um, larger balances and so forth. And um, and then of that superannuation, about 14% goes into residential property. So, um, but if you've got a technology company and you list it on the ASX, you can get a great multiple. In fact, some of the multiples in the ASX over the last couple of years have been um, pretty extreme uh, and probably on par or even superseding uh, the sort of valuations you get in Silicon Valley. And that's great from the perspective of the fact that when you're when you're when you're um, listed you have a very flat share structure you don't have this convoluted layers of um, preferred um, stock series a series b series c because a lot of the valuations in technology have been manufactured in the valley through um, liquidation preference and ratchets and other other um, contractual mechanisms for um, for generating these high valuations which haven't been real but on australia you've actually managed to generate them with an, or an ordering structure it's actually been quite beneficial from that perspective um, the, the negative thing about running a technology company here in Australia is that you, you can't um, find people with experience who've got sort of 10 years in technology. If you're a serious technologist, uh, after about 10 years, you kind of go to Silicon Valley, you kind of, uh, you get, you get, you, know, you go work at uh, Google or Facebook or, or somewhere over there where you've got the deep expertise and you, you can actually learn and go to the next level. Um, in Australia, it kind of caps out after, after a few years, you know, the, the expertise is not really here, it all, it all goes, uh, or they start their own company. And the other thing is that in in some areas, um, um, some of the job um, the job functions are very very hard to hire, and um, the, the costs escalate quite rapidly. So, for example, in computer science, um, you're seeing now um, your grads two three years etc. Sometimes getting their salaries uh, double and so forth, which becomes a real problem in terms of trying to build a technology base here. So, sorry, Matt. Um, look, one of the things we sort of run from an investment perspective is that you know when the, when the Australian dollar has sort of hit parity with the US dollar, it was very hard to, for for any company that was international to to justify sticking another employee in Australia just because you say, well, for the same prices, I, well, I can hire somebody in Australia, I can hire somebody in the US or or even Europe or the UK, if, you know, cheap on a cheaper basis. Um, we've Aussie dollars obviously fallen back to sort of seven, closer to seventy cents now. From your perspective, it is it starting to get to the point where um, it, it, sound, it sounds as if it's still uh, more expensive to buy somebody in Australia at, at, a, at, a, at a senior level than what you'd find elsewhere? Or is, is that from a, is there a price issue as well as a, a talent issue still at the current at current um, exchange rates? Do we see, need to see those fall further, I guess, before Australian employees yes. become more yeah. attractive? It depends on what job function you're talking about. So I have offices in seven countries around the world. So I have offices in uh, London, Vancouver, San Francisco, right, you know, right, right the heart of the valley, um, Manila, uh, at Buenos Aires, and Jakarta. And what I find is, um, you know, that particularly in um, computer science, software engineering, um, the wages are getting out of control. And uh, when I say out of control, I mean literally, you can see them double, double in the space of two or three years after graduation. Um, however, the valley has just gone crazy. Like to, to try and hire someone in the valley now, it is just almost impossible. Um, you know, the average salary for just an, an American in any job function in San Francisco is eighty-seven thousand US dollars. Um, but when you start getting into into, into um, you know, software development, you can be paying two fifty, three hundred, four hundred k for you know mid-level uh, person fully loaded. Um, but more of a problem is that in the Valley, people just don't really want to work because the demand is so high. You know, everyone we hire in the San Francisco office tells me, oh, can I work from home two days a week, three days a week, four days a week? You know, um, if they have a chiropractor appointment, they take the whole day off. You know, they like it's really and at five o'clock they want to go home. So it's certainly a better environment than, than, than Silicon Valley, which has just gone stupid. But if you go somewhere like London, I mean, the rents are very expensive in London, but, but the salaries are much less. Um, so you, you can hire a grad for um, about 60% of the price that you would, you would pay for a software engineer in Australia on a dollar for dollar basis. And um, uh, the senior salaries top out uh, pretty early in, in, uh, in London. So um, there are, and then of course we have about 100, 200 um, engineers in, in Manila where it's significantly cheaper, but there, there, we have done a um, cost benefit analysis on that in terms of productivity. And uh, we do find the productivity is a bit lower there, but um, if we can get that productivity up, it will, it, it's obviously a massive, massive powerhouse. And, and advantage. So why, why do you base yourself here? 
Well, uh, it's a good question. Um, if I had a choice about doing it all again, I probably wouldn't. Um, uh, I, my last company was headquartered in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. And, um, you know, I made a decision back in 2000 uh, to move back after I graduated and uh, had worked for a couple of years in the Valley uh, because of uh, quality of life. Um, uh, but now, you know, a lot of the regulations that that's come in, particularly at the state level in, in New South Wales, I would, I would change my mind as well as, you know, all the issues you have running a tech company. So, um, now where would, where would I probably start a company today? If I had a chance to do it all over again, I'd probably think about doing it in London. Okay. And Matt, actually just, um, just going back to, um, speaking around, uh, the, the inflated sort of prices you're paying, it sounds like, um, on the, on the West coast in the U S actually reminds me a bit of my engineering time doing the mining boom when, um, you know, people that would empty the bins in the, uh, in the huts were jumping jobs for $20,000 pay rises and you mean going, they're going from 120 to 140. That speaks to me like there is, um, it's just a, is it a, just a scarcity thing that you just can't find good people and you just got to pay overs every time? That, that's exactly it. And the tenure in yep. the Valley, I mean, you, you, the, I have a friend who's actually dating someone that one of the, one of the tech startups there. He said the, the, the average um, tenure is six months. And when you, you bring someone on and you train them up, it takes a month or two to train up and then four months later they're gone. I mean, how do you run a company? It's impossible. So it, it, it is a supply issue. And, um, and, and the supply issue is also acute um, in, in Australia as well, but only in specific areas. So the interesting thing is um, it, it's, it's really highly concentrated in software engineering. Um, it's not so hard to find, find designers. Um, there's also a lot of people are coming from overseas to Australia to, to do design. Um, data sciences is usually fairly straightforward because if you have a degree in any of the sciences, um, either you're going to work in a, a government facility or become an academic or um, work in finance, or you go into data science and technology. So it is not so hard to find data scientists who are very, very, very high quality for, for a, a reasonable amount. Um, but it's in certain areas, particularly acute also in um, DevOps, which is a part of um, software revolving around um, managing so systems, so cloud computing, uh, because there's obviously this explosion with Google and Amazon and and um, you know everything they've been moving to AWS and so forth. And in that particular area, the system administrators, who actually used to be the lower ranked uh, engineers uh, on the food chain, are actually now uh, commanding very very high salaries. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean that was my 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 anecdote from from innovation side, and, and that was where it was sort of stretching into yours as well that you know i started a, a company in um uh two th in 2000 99 2000 and and you know we the 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 office we we're in the server rooms didn't couldn't handle the the machines and so we had portable air conditioners and somebody had to go in and set them up and and, and empty the water on the weekend and you know i had to take backup tapes home every few days we had we needed the dba and and you know and all these system administrators and multiple machines and all that and so we probably spent, I don't know, 100, at least 150, probably 200 a year on, on that. And I think I'm doing the, the same plus more on AWS for maybe 100 for the cost, yeah. possibly <laughs> less. Yeah, just crazy in terms of the, that. So so from that perspective, you sort of think that innovation has got this whole, um, and it seems in the US there's that, that, there's that whole attitude now, you know, set it up in your garage and, and off you go. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to be an attitude in the, the average um Australian graduate, I suppose. Well, I mean, the, the, the graduates we, we produce are actually quite good. It's just the issue is there are not very many of them. I mean, I just went to the National Computer Science uh, School's um, lunch because I'm one of the, the platinum sponsors for this. And, you know, they were crowing about how they produce 130 um, graduates um, per year. Um, that are really school kids are going into university. So it's kind of like an intermediary step to, to get the elite of the elite out of um, the school system into um, into tertiary education and computer science. And, you know, I was in the room with, you know, Atlassian and the Australian Signals Directorate and um, Wise Tech and a bunch of other tech companies that sponsor it. And we walked out and I, I turned to Atlassian and said, what's your graduate intake this year? And they said 160. <laughs> 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 so, you know, and, and the, the, the school was like 130. It's a national program. <laughs> <program. laughs> it's like, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know. It's just not at the right scale, anywhere near the right scale. And like, if you look at like, surely, you know, surely that's a, a private market opportunity, isn't it? Well, I mean, where where's the market failure there? Like... Well, the market the market failure is in the primary school system, and so the secondary school system, which in particular year seven to year, year ten, because if you ask any kid, would you like to work on the next Facebook, um, SpaceX, you know, Google Glasses, you know, self driving cars? They, every kid can put his hand up or her hand up and say, yeah, absolutely, love to do that. But they can't connect the dots between what they taught in school and a career 
um, you know, when I graduated um, in 1990 from high school, I went to a quite a good primary school, uh, a private school in um, Sydney. You know, I thought that engineering had something to do with driving trains. I hadn't even been introduced to the word engineer. Um, I went back and I did careers a fair um, not so long ago uh, at that school. And again, the kids just still thought engineering was something to do with driving trains. They just can't connect the dots. Um, the curriculum, curriculum hasn't really changed in, in, a, in a very, very, very long time. Um, um, for the most part, uh, there, there is some stuff around the edges. You know, the, the IT, you know, or the computer science teacher at high school reports to the woodwork teacher. It's it's more of a trade than it is uh, a science. Um, you know, mathematics in schools has declined, um, uh, and so forth. And and the, in the enrolment in in comp sci, um, you know, there's uh, it's really in a long term trend been declining quite quite. Um, a lot in the last decade uh, or more, actually. Um, in fact, and this is kind of universally around the world. I mean, it's, it wasn't really since the, um, the, the 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 Viking landing on Mars and the moon, moon and the moon landing that um, um, you know since then enrollments in in sort of the hard science has been declining, uh, even in the US. Uh, although there's been an uptick in the last number of years um, in computer science specifically um, since the uh, social network came out, which is the Facebook movie. Mm, okay. And, and, and so I guess what comes to mind here, though, and you mentioned there that it all sort of starts at the primary school systems, it sort of lends itself to um, it almost certainly needs a political response, would you say? Is this is this sort of um, something that you think would, would help correct that yeah. up in the longer term? It is a longer term play, though, probably much longer than your average politician term. So, uh. <laughs> well, we have we have we have big failings in the. I think political system in Australia. Um, the first is we need to really have a national narrative that we need to make it an imperative to build a technology and advanced manufacturing focused economy. And we really need to change the economy from a very simple one of digging up dirt, literally, and shipping overseas and immigration um, to try and pump up a failing economy and blowing a housing bubble. We need to be producing, uh, creating industries that are uh, productivity and wealth multipliers uh, because we have a relatively small number um, of people uh, in this country. And um, you know, to do that, it really is a multi multi level thing. I mean, the government has to be talking about this, and more than just you know a, an innovation statement or jobs and growth or a throwaway line, uh, which isn't even in, even in the narrative. isn't even in the narrative nowadays with, 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 with the politicians. I mean, that was kind of the, that was blamed for Malcolm Turnbull's um, you know, demise. Um, uh, it needs to be with you know, with the school the school system, but the problem is the school system is just tied up with bureaucracy. We produce actually too many school teachers at at, the, at these levels. In fact, not, not every school teacher coming out of teachers college can get can get a place. And so the ones that have actually got places are desperately trying to hold on to, and they, uh, hold on to their positions. And they don't want to really modern, want to want to modernise the curriculum because they'll have, they'll feel threatened by the the, the, the new teachers that are coming out. Uh, of, of the system, um, and then parents, you know, we've, and we've got and the, the way we set up the whole um, tertiary um, educational system to, to get into the tertiary education system. You've got like, this leaderboard, which comes out of the, the, the secondary school system, like the, the high school certificate, um, or you know, the various you know state by state models for for that. And you get a score, and that score tells you that top of the top of the rank is you can become a doctor or a lawyer. And God knows we don't need any more lawyers, and um, and they are having problems placing all the doctors. Um, uh, that are coming out of um, uh, coming out of uh, university uh, to to get their residency. So, uh, but there's no there's no discussion anywhere on, on the spectrum about um, you know engineering or science or technology. And um, really, the great thing about these industries are these industries that create the future, that create businesses, that create um, industries. And um, you know, I can't think of industry in the world where a 20 year old can kind of come out and you know a decade later have created one of the biggest companies in the world, which being Facebook or being Google. Or, so, do, do you think there's a part to play um, in in industry then, and, and, and corporates such as yourself, who are very successful, have found a good niche in the market, um, in in helping to provide some colour around that narrative? I'm only just I'm just putting it out there, I guess, because it doesn't feel like the government's going to do a lot. So, <laughs> go to the go to the other side. But um, is there is there sort of something in that, particularly perhaps in Australia, where you know, look, um, for those that are in technology, know the Atlassian fellows, know yourself. Um, Outside of that, though, um, you know, if you speak to someone in the street, they, you know, they'd probably name, um, you know, perhaps one or two US tech uh, entrepreneurs, but you know, sort of it falls short there. Is it, is that sort of something? Because I'm just thinking, in, in a sense, the parents are the ones that are perhaps are guiding the kids into, um, you know, into their, a sort of vocation or a direction as well at home. I mean, certainly, and and, and industry here has has been doing things for some time. Um, you know, um, it's just that the scale that our industry exists in this country is is really 
quite small and and sub sub economic in many ways. So, you know, there's there's limited things that that a company of my size can do. Um, you know, obviously, Atlassian's a bit bigger, and there's a few other companies etc. out there. And you know, Richard White from WiseTech is doing a lot. He's he's funding everything he can to do with educational programs for for computer science. But you know, at the end of the day, it's only a, a, a small drop in the ocean compared to what ha needs to happen at a national mm. scale. And it also um, sounds like well, if, if, you, if you've got second thoughts as to whether you'd, you'd start a company in Australia as well, there's obviously, um, you know, if the, if the existing players are still can't, can't work out a, a reason to, to, to be here, then it sounds as if there's certainly st some significant structural changes that would need to be made. Sure. And we need to do more than, it's more than just sort of STEM. I mean, it's things like building up good um, trade schools um, around, um, you know, to bring, you know, manufacturing back to the country. And if we're, we're going to bring manufacturing back to the country, we need to do it in a way where we can deal with the fact that we have very, very high wages. So we've got to do advanced manufacturing, we've got to, you know, robotics or whatever it may be. And I think we've got to, we've got to really strengthen the trade schools and, and to build that sort of bring that base back, um, as opposed to kind of um, very low skilled and low, you know, low value add um, um, manufacturing like nappies. And of course, if we produce nappies, of course, they're going to go to the cities because people, um, it's a country of low wages. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Matt, are you a fan of the sort of hub approach where some cities and governments around the world, well, many in fact, have, have tried to create technology hubs through providing various infrastructure? Like this? Um, I don't believe in it from a perspective of let's build a building, which seems to be a lot of the you know the, the approach. Let's build a precinct and kind of put people in the precinct. Yeah, um, it doesn't make any sense to me. Well, what does make sense is picking industries where we want to be world leaders. Um, you know, China does this. You know, China gets up and says, you know, their version of the budget. They get up and say, here are the, here are the five critical areas we want to lead the world in. You know, artificial intelligence. You know, quantum. You know, this, that, the other. In Australia, Australia, we don't do that. We just kind of discuss what transfer payments we're going to make back to the populace here, have some of your own money back that you paid in taxes and, you know, you, you can pretend we're doing something for you, right? You know, we, we, so we should think about, you know, for example, mining technology, you know, we could be a world leader in mining technology. That's an area we could probably build some, some you know, some expertise. Um, you know, we, we have um, an environment where we could do, you know, really well for solar, solar powered and other form of renewables, you know, with all the desert we have and all the sunshine, sunshine that hits it, there's probably something you can do there. Well, I mean, we, we, we did have, Terrific leadership in solar in the eighties and nineties, especially at UNSW. Well, I mean, it, it it was it was so thoroughly ignored and and disparaged by the Howard government of the day that they ended up selling most of the IP to the Germans and Chinese. That's right. Who, who developed it and um, sold it back to us? But but um, I mean, that raises an interesting question as well. You know, obviously we're in a bit of a context now of almost technological warfare in this sort of developing uh, Cold War 2.0 and, and and wild allegations from, you know, all fronts on stolen technology and, and sort of embedded espionage and what have you, yeah. um, especially around China. Um, does China impact you in any way that's, you know, uh, good or bad? Look, I think everyone has to be naive to think that um, all that... Um, I think that all governments didn't involve themselves in this sort of thing. Um, I think it's kind of what the, you know, gain, gaining an edge in, in trade. I'm pretty sure that's kind of a remit of a lot of um, a lot of departments in a lot of different countries, um, uh, governments. Um, look, in terms of China, I think um, the issue with China is it's kind of hard to operate there as a technology company being an internet company um, because you need special licensing and 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 so forth. Um, you know, I'd like to think that um, you know, we gen generally across um, uh, many countries of the world, my company is very well received because we bring opportunity and, and income through you know, providing jobs and technical areas to, to people around the world. So I generally like to think that um, we're well received. And um, you know, in places like Malaysia, for example, the Malaysian government through their uh, MDEC program, which is the development um, corporation, uh, actually goes and uh, educates people in rural communities on how to use my website. Um, in or because they believe that the, to get the bottom 20% socioeconomically um, uh, fully productive, you, you know, being being people, you've, you've got to get the micro work in the cloud. So, um, you know, two days a week, part-time work, whatever it may be, job by job, um, whether it's in uh, remote locations or whether someone's um, aged or whether someone's um, disabled or whatever it may be. Um, you know, China's a massive market, but the problem is to try and compete as a technology company in that market, uh, being external is, is difficult. I mean, Donald Trump's trying to negotiate as part of the free trade agreement that they're working on with uh, the US, the ability for a US company to own 100% of the equity of a Chinese um, uh, subsidiary. Uh, we'll see kind of where that goes. Um, but, uh, 
no, we no, we don't. Although we we do have um, um, U.S. customers that um, operate in China that want us to operate in China as part of some partnership with we're doing with them, and we're, we're going to have to try and figure this out in some way. I guess I guess where David was possibly leaving with some of those questions. So, what about what about sort of fundamental views on a on a um, in terms of where we've been buying stocks was is is looking upon this as as being that I think. There, there wouldn't be too many banks or or um, people with uh, or government agencies who would hap who would have happily bought servers from say Russia over the last 10 15 years and, and installed them on their machines and and not thought twice about it whereas we sort of feel as if that's very much been the case for China that people have just yeah buy a server or, or buy components or whatever and they happen to be Chinese they happen to be Chinese given the spate of um, you know, spy chips and and accusations and, and hacking and all that type of stuff like that I guess we we've made the we're taking the view that um, going forward it will be an issue for companies and, and they will need to say well you know if I'm a if I'm a chief technology officer of a bank should I buy servers that were only made in China or should I maybe you know spend another 20 percent and get something from 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 somewhere else is that something that I guess you're seeing flowing through, or is, it, or do you think we're off the mark on that on that thought? I think a little bit off the mark. I mean, this is, I mean, China's been the the great three D printer for America. I mean, like you, you send everything to China, get it printed, get it made, and 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 that's why the the, the U S. economy has kind of grown so well because you can get things done very 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 cheaply, um, and um, you can take that technology, and you can kind of build businesses with it. Um, now, of course, the the U S. is now seeing that as a threat. And, and saying, well, wow, uh, we're kind of at a point now where, um, you know, if we don't do something about this, um, potentially, you know, our um, hegemony can be can be can be threatened by a, by a new a new world power because it has been a bit fairly um, unipolar world, um, you know, in the last uh, decade or so. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, China is a phenomenal resource for actually getting things um, manufactured and made. Um, uh, it's you know, it's it's. It's unsurpassed in, uh, in many areas in terms of the expertise and the skills. I mean, people used to go there for cheap labor. You don't go there so much for cheap labor anymore. You go there for the expertise and the skills and, and the supply chains they've set up. I mean, you, you know, if you there was, there was comments about um, uh, Trump was trying to get Tim Cook to kind of um, produce the iPhone back in, in America again. The problem is that you know even to kind of to assemble the phone and get the screws to to put in the phone, you just, they didn't have the supply chain to be able to actually go and source the screws. It's, everything's been they moved to China, so maybe from a strategic perspective, it's been a, it's been a mistake, and this is why letting the, the manufacturing side of Australia fall apart um, uh, has been a bit of a mistake. But um, you know, it, it kind of it is what it is. If you, if you kind of want to, um, you kind of want to avoid that um, and not have a disadvantage by having to pay a premium uh, to use technologies that are sourced elsewhere. You need to do something about building the manufacturing uh, side of your economy back up again. So, how would you go about? Like we kind of discussed tech and. Uh, you know, the contests with China. But, I mean, for manufacturers, it's even more kind of critical, isn't it, when I remember talking to um, to quite innovative innovative firm. I think he was doing some kind of um, building products but quite sophisticated stuff, and he said he, he had about 60 days before uh, his Chinese competitors were producing or reproducing his new product uh, <coughs> at half the price. <laughs> So, so I mean, how, how do you go about kind of rebuilding um, your manufacturing sector when you're confronted with such a ruthless and, and uh, competitive um, environment? Well, when you're in business, you kind of just have to out execute. I mean, like with a, if you run a website like mine, someone can throw up a website that operates like freelancer, like even easier than you can, you can manufacture a product. So, I mean, a website is just a website. Anyone can. Can write some software and kind of copy everything you've done and you just have to out execute them in terms of um in in, in, in terms of your performance right you've got to figure out a smarter way to, to kind of do things and, and just bear in mind that anyone can kind of copy your website and that literally that literally happens like you know like look at facebook and snapchat snapchat comes out snapchat comes out the feature next thing facebook just copies it right uh instagram copies it right so you've got to you've just got to execute better um and just and just you know acknowledge that the, the competition is getting um uh, pretty extreme but in terms of how would you rebuild manufacturing um i think you know you just have to probably deal with the fact that in australia that the wages can be very 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 high um as a result of that we have to be producing um um goods that are higher up the value chain 
Um, you know, we have to elaborately transform the um, things that we dig out of the ground. And rather than ship the raw materials, we have to find a way to kind of add value, economic value to them. We've got to do that with technology. We've got to do that with many advanced manufacturing techniques. We've got to do that with like um, robotics. I think we need to build the skills up in the country around this and not just at the university level, but I do think at the trade school level. I mean, the one thing about America, when you go to America and you, you see people working in the you know, machine shops and uh, working on, you know, even even those shows on TV, they show up to you, um, like uh, taking cars, classic cars and, 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 and um, you know, renovating them and so forth, right? The, the, the skills just seem to be at a completely different level from what we have in this country. Um, um, and so I think... Well, I mean, the US manufacturing sector is roughly the size of the Australian economy. There you go. So it's got some uh, critical mass for it to, uh, to work with. I think that the, one of the ways... I mean, there, there are massive problems with the political system, and I can talk about it in a second, but, but that aside, I think one of the ways you can, I think, fairly rapidly um, change... Uh, industry, the economy and, and so forth is through education. Education is the lubricant for upwards mobility. And, you know, you put someone through an engineering degree or a trade school and four years later, they pop out the other side and they will go into the industry, you know, in, in more advanced jobs with higher paying wages and ultimately pay more taxes because um, they'll be in higher paid jobs. Um, or they'll start businesses and, and generate um, value in, in that way. And so I think um, what I would do is I would, you've got to find some way to fix the, the, the late secondary school system so that kids can see the career path from, you know, particularly uh, before year 10, because by year 11 and 12, they're kind of picking subjects for the HSC and then kind of that, that's, it, that's it. You need to find a way to get that, that path going. And then you probably need to provide some incentives in the, in the educational system, both the university and the trade schools for people to go into some um, select areas, which are areas which will be um, great productivity and wealth multipliers for the country. So in parts of engineering, parts of trade schools, maybe we should be um, providing free education again, um, instead of um, stripping the universities um, of uh, funding and forcing them to become really degree meals um, for uh, students. Or the immigration system, which is probably what they've become. I mean, I've, I've seen, for example, the University of Sydney. I mean, when I went through 91, 92, 93, 94, 96, the, the, the lecturers there wrote the textbooks that I used at Stanford University when I did my grad school. So Ross Quinlan, for example, wrote the textbook on artificial intelligence that I used at Stanford University. Neil Westy, who went on uh, who, um, uh, to develop um, uh, Radiata, which did the Wi-Fi chips, he wrote the textbook that I used in Stanford for VLSI design. Right, uh, and and that's changed a lot. The universities now focus more on you know, teaching how to use Microsoft Office because it's more lucrative for them than they, than they do with the, with the advanced um, the advanced skills. Uh, no, no kidding, they make Sydney University make, I think makes more money off the, off the office courses than they do off anything else. And in fact, they, for the, to the advanced technology courses, they can't teach them because they only have you know they try and teach an advanced power systems course, and only eight students will enroll. Um, so they've got. To, I've told the universities they need to go to an online model. And, and and rather than spending you know twenty million dollars in a building, spend twenty million dollars on a website, and and instead of having eight students in a course in an on, um, in the physical world, you can have eight thousand by going into the world and and just having these sort of deep silos in, of expertise where you know you teach very specific subjects, but you teach them to the world. Do you find um, because you do a big, you do a fair bit of lecturing yourself, don't you? Is that right? I stopped I stopped after fourteen years out of frustration. Um, yeah. And that was that. What, the frustration was just this decline in pedagogical standards, or I taught two subjects. I taught cryptography or computer security, uh, and I taught technology entrepreneurship. And these are fairly multidisciplinary courses. And what I would find was I taught out the engineering faculty, the, the electrical engineering uh, school in particular. And even though the science students would have the same um, subjects, they could get credit only if they're enrolled in electrical engineering. So I could teach entrepreneurship, but I could only teach it to um, electrical engineers. I couldn't teach it to mechanical engineers. I couldn't teach it to aerospace. I couldn't teach it to business students. I couldn't teach it to medicine and I couldn't teach it to science students. And so I have all these people in my class attending and I'd, I'd bring out these um, amazing lecturers to guest lecture. I had like the head of data science from Amazon and you know, everyone coming come, come to the class. And the classroom would be full, but the number of students could actually take it for credit was very, very, very small. And after 14 years of this, and saying this is completely ridiculous, 
you need to have a way in which people can enroll in these subjects uh, and take it for credit. Um, I just gave up. Um, so I, I thought, you know, I, I'll get around to teaching online at some point in the future and, um, you know, yeah, but what would change that way? And did you have much? Um, did you have much to do in the? I guess the setting of the standards because I'll just I'll give you a quick quick anecdote as well because it's I found I was doing lecturing for uh, the the SIA and then that turned into Fincia and then Fincia got bought by Kaplan and it took me a little while to work out that I'd I'd gone from working for an industry to to having a second job but it took and then, but but I found the the standards as things went online dropped dramatically and. There was stuff where, for me, it was saying, no, no, this, the levels of people that should have passed because they turn up to a classroom every week and they'd sort of learn by osmosis or I'm sitting here doing nothing, I'll, I'll have to pick it up versus the online model where I suspect most of the students went, yeah, I'll do it next week, I'll do it next week, I'll do it next week. Geez, I've got to watch 10 hours worth of lectures all in all in a week before they do the exam and, and the, the level really, really dropped. And I guess that's where I'm sort of, yeah, my experience was saying, well, I sort of feel as if you almost need to go back to the classroom for some of these just to just to make sure you've actually got the involvement and you've got the buy-in from people. Well, it doesn't have to be like that. And it's, and I, and it's interesting you brought up Finzia because I actually, um, for fun, did a grad dip in um, applied finance at Finzia, um, uh, just as an aside. And I found the quality actually of the course material was actually very, very, very good. And then it got acquired by Kaplan and I, I actually quit and I just did a master of applied finance all over again at Macquarie for fun on the side uh, because I, you know, I, I didn't want to do it with Kaplan. Um, uh, look, I, with the online um, method of education, I think you, 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 there's many different models. I think one of the most uh, effective models is probably the flipped classroom model uh, in a way where you can, um, the, the delivery of the course is done in an online fashion, but there is a, um, a the tutors are there not to teach the material, um, or the lecturers are there not to teach the material, but to really help people progress through. So for example, um, you know, using, with analytics now, with online education, you can kind of see these people are gonna make it, I'll leave them alone. These people are struggling, but we'll probably get there, so I'll leave them alone. These people are not gonna make it, I can spend some time with them. And um, and in fact, it's funny, I started doing F45, which is like this, uh, this gym class. It's the same model. Like, in fact, the whole class is just run. The instructions that the gym class are run on screens and the instructors don't don't run the class anymore. They just come around and can they help you if you, if you, if you uh, improve, improve your technique. And I think, um, you know, it, it comes down to really the, the quality of the, of the content that's written and the quality of the, the assessment and, um, and then kind of the interaction, that, uh, how interactive you have the, um, the, you know, the, the, the engagement around the actual class. But I don't think necessarily it has to be um, a lower quality. I mean, certainly it's a lot easier to put education online. So you do get some low, lower quality courses, but I think it's still, you can actually get a far superior uh, outcome. And the reason why it can be a superior outcome is because if you think about universities today, Statistics 101 is taught in every university in the world by different lecturers, different departments, different levels of quality. Uh, different curriculums, etc. You know, instead, you could find the best lecturer in the world to teach the best quality course that gets the best results, um, which you can measure analytically. Then all these other people that are teaching it, you can free them up to teach the things they really want to teach. You know, in their field of expertise. Yeah, no, no. Look, I mean, I'm certainly with you. It's just, it's yeah. There's obviously problems we still haven't solved in terms of getting that next stage because I think, all, I mean, all the Harvard and all the Stanford stuff, or maybe till the Stanford. Courses are all online now, aren't they, for free? Yeah. And so, but you don't, you obviously, you know, me jumping on and reading a few of those isn't quite the same as uh, as, as going to stand for getting the degree and going through the, the extra process to, yeah. But and, and I suppose that also comes back to that whole point about education is saying, well, our current education system was set up 100 years ago, pre-computers and pre all this other stuff. And, and we just keep on churning out the same thing. And Well, we're, 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 training, we're training people to prepare for jobs that don't exist anymore. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a key part of it, Matt, that the, the course curriculum needs to change, you know, on, on a dime and, you know, having it online gives you the ability to do it, you know, on a, on a weekly basis as need be. I guess the question for me actually was, as an, as a, um, as an employer, um, so you, I guess, obviously, um, you know, pu pushing the barrier now for, for an online sort of university style, if you sort of sat down in front of two graduates, one was, you know, uh, from a, a, you know, a, an Ivy League, for want of a better term, Melbourne, um, you know. Or, sandstone. Yeah, Sandstone, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, in Australia, we call that. Um, a university versus someone who's done something online, perhaps even, it could be a US one. Um, would, so you would see those guys in, in a similar light, you know, vis-a-vis -vis same grades and all the rest of it? 
Um, it really does depend by institution. Um, we've, I have calibrated my, my rankings of the institutions over time. But you know, I have, I've had people come and apply for jobs who have come from overseas, for example, and they've said, they're putting their putting their CV that they've done a bunch of courses on um, you know on, on you know Harvard X or MIT X or uh, Stanford X or um, you know Coursera or what have you and I and, and when they've gone through and they've actually got the assessment the key thing is the assessment whether they've gone through the, the, the assessment and they've actually done well um, I I do I do actually rank that okay so you mentioned you mentioned robotics and AI and and we're training people for the uh, disappearing jobs the jobs of the past. Um, what what sort of future do you see for uh, for artificial intelligence and, and automation? I guess I'm thinking particularly uh, in the services sectors that yeah. you know to date have been relatively quarantined from that movement, but but seem to be being, sort of steadily being dragged in. Any job that's described by an algorithm will go away. Um, that can be described by an algorithm. Um, it's happening first in. Um, white collar jobs, but it will happen in blue collar jobs. If you kind of see the stuff that Boston Dynamics is doing with robotics and, um, you know, there's some phenomenal videos on YouTube about, um, you know, uh, applications, so warehouses, um, you know, pickers and packers and so forth. Um, I think that one of the great social disruptions of our time, which is coming, um, is going to be through through this. Um, it's probably going to be, uh, the, the, the big impact is probably going to be in transportation. Um, where if you think about the number of people who drive for a living, uh, whether it's couriers, taxi drivers, uh, bus drivers, um, you know, truckers and so forth, um, you know, I think that we are not that far away, um, it, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe 10 years, but it's not that far away from a point uh, where those jobs will just go wholesale, wholesale and um, they'll be gone forever. Um, you know, there's no reason why someone should be driving a truck um, for, you know, 40 years, um, you know, eight to 12 hours a day or whatever the, the, the safety standards that you drive nowadays. Um, it's a very unhealthy job. It's a very dangerous job and it's a very, it's a very inefficient job and you can do it much better with, with software. And I think this will happen. It'll happen. Well, the software doesn't need amphetamines either. Well, I think, I think it will happen very quickly. I mean, you're obviously seeing all the things that Tesla's doing and Tesla is kind of almost, um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if they're, I wouldn't say it's kind of questionable how reckless they're being, I think, in, in, in terms of letting people using their um, self-driving features um, immediately. But it, it is not that far away from the point where the switch driver will be. You will not be able to buy a car that's not self-driving. It would just happen that every manufacturer is just making self-driving cars. They'll do that and it will start probably um, in a big way, I think, in like some of the professional um, driving um, um, uh, uh industries such as you know trucking and so forth where they'll just say for safety reasons and for efficiency reasons in on highways um you know the only, only trucks that can operate are, are self-driving um and then what will happen very rapidly after that is the insurance companies will cotton on and they will say well you know driving your own, you want to drive your own car do you well that's especially unacceptable as smoking right you know and um you know if you want to drive your own car let's Let's pull up your driving record and compare it to the computer. And let me look at your driving records with the computer. Therefore, your premium is higher. And um, yeah, the insurance companies will ensure that um, that you know it will just go self drive, full self driving. And then people will go, okay, well actually the experience is, is pretty good. I can actually go out and drink now and be picked up by a car and driven home from the pub. And I and I'd have to worry about you know um, about um, drink driving. I can. Um, Go Sydney to Melbourne and pop a sleeping tablet and wake up and you know I'm in I'm, I'm in Melbourne I can um, you know I can do my work in the back of my laptop um, on the way to work um, rather than kind of worry about um, you know being in the front you know, keeping my eyes on the road etc. So I think it, I think the switch is going to happen very very quickly like that I think you're all uh, old enough to remember you know when mobile phones suddenly were everywhere and 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 um, you know, a year before they weren't. And um, the same thing will happen, I think, with self-driving cars probably in the next decade. But, but in terms of social impact, there's going to be a big dislocation because you'll have all these professional truck drivers, taxi drivers, courier drivers. I mean, the taxi drivers aren't even coping with the world of Uber, right? I mean, you look at the the, dem the demographic of taxi drivers and the literacy levels and the intelligence levels and the educational levels compared to Uber drivers, and there's a, there's a massive demographic shift there alone. And you're not going to retrain truck drivers to write software, let alone serve a coffee in a cafe. I think from memory, there's about 250,000 uh, drivers at risk in Australia, uh, professional drivers. Um, what, what, do you, what about the, the sort of higher value ad services, you know, the professions? Um, like I remember a few years ago, uh, 
there was a lot of press around IBM's Dr. Watson and whatever, but some of those things seem to have gone a little more quiet. Do, do, does AI have a role in the future of those as well, do you think? Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, large parts of medical um, medicine, as well as law, um, are basically humans are just expert systems. They go through years and years and years of training, reading medical, medical books and reading um, you know, law books and, and, and the rules and regulations and so forth. And um, then they kind of have to, have to come to solutions based upon that, you know, diagnosis, for example, or um, you know, trying to craft a, 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 a legal case. And, and those jobs will go wholesale uh, uh, in, 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 a, in a big way, um, you know. Um, and and it's, it's, it's been starting for a while. It's been starting um, uh, with, uh, with outsourcing. So, um, you know, through the mid-2000s, you know, if you've got an X-ray done at the hospital, chances are that the diagnosis was done by someone in India. Um, and then ultimately, um, those jobs will be described by algorithms, and then they'll go. Um, you know, and and I think that, I think there will be a, lot, a big change there. And then of course, that will lead to better better diagnosis. It will lead to probably better outcomes and um, less lawyers, which is could always be a good thing. Yeah. Hmm. But, but social disruption in the, in the meantime. Well, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, though. I mean, obviously, what you're describing is a big productivity lift as well. So, well, the thing about um, the the thing about this in the white collar world is that the, the people in the white collar world um, can um, retrain. Um, it's, I mean, it's a lot more flexible workforce to go on. You know, you used to be a doctor. You can now go to a startup, right? Um, you start your own company. You can do whatever. It's a bit harder in the blue collar jobs if all you've done in your life is stack boxes or drive a truck to go. Hey, you got to find a new job in the in the in the in the, in the <laughs> incredibly competitive technology savvy world of you know 2020 2030. Yeah, well, I guess that's where policy has to play a role in some way in uh, helping address and retrain. Um, so I, I also, I guess, I'm conscious we're uh, sort of approaching the hour here. I, I, I also want to um, just take you back a bit. You described, you know, you had um, seven offices around the world, pretty much covering all the major continents. Um, what are you seeing in terms of business, like in terms of demand and uh, you know, are you seeing, you described, you know, this wages boom in the US, are you seeing that as a, as a, you know, a virtuous cycle or does that look like it's topping out? Um, how are you finding Europe? Uh, you know, how's, how's Asia? Um, any trends that, that, you know, that you can really kind of describe? Yeah. So, well, on one level, the underlying, I mean, the, the technology industry is fantastic because as Mark Andreessen said, every industry is becoming a software industry and software is eating the world. Like literally every business you know of is becoming a software business. You know, the, the biggest telephone company in the world is a software company. It's Skype. You know, the biggest bookstore in the world, biggest retailer in the world is a software company. It's Amazon. And it just goes industry by industry by industry. What happened, however, in the last two or three years is the we're in a three-way trade war between Europe, um, the US and China. And... Um, the regulation that has come into the technology industry is extreme. Um, you know, uh, Apple gets fined 14 billion euros in Ireland, and then Deutsche Bank gets fined 14 billion dollars uh, for something from by the US. And then you have the Europeans come out with GDPR, which is ostensibly to protect um, the privacy of consumers, but in real fact, it's to damage uh, US technology companies and um, and you know. Uh, and, and try and get some sort of European technology industry going. Then you have VAT uh, being launched by the Europeans in the country of purchase of a digital download. So if you're, if you're a French person uh, on a train to Germany through Belgium, uh, uh, you've got to figure out which country is that person in in order to levy the VAT rates. And there's like 24, I think, different VAT rates in, um, in, in, um, in uh, Europe. You know, India has now come out with a, with, um, a, a law around GST, uh, we now have someone who has to calculate for the, I believe it's 36 states of India, GST on a monthly basis and sit returns um, because you have to collect one percent GST. Um, uh, you know, uh, the you know then you've got the California Department of Business Oversight who says we think now that um, if you have an online marketplace and you make a payment in that online marketplace. That payment may look like um, a, a actual um, money transmission and, or, or escrow. And as a result, we're going to regulate marketplaces like we regulate payment systems. And now to the regulation for payment system, I actually own uh, escrow.com, which is the world's oldest and largest online escrow company. It's got about um, 5.5 billion in payments through it. And it's for buying and selling 
airplanes, boats, cars, jewelry, gemstones, diamonds, what have you. Um, to operate in the US, there are 50 states. It's state by state licensing. Four states do not require licensing. Uh, there are six territories. So you need 52 financial services licenses to operate in the US, right? I have 46. <laughs> so yeah, I'm on my way. Um, you know, it, in, in every state, you have to be fingerprinted, palm printed, arm printed, finan uh, balance sheet of assets, background checks. Uh, it's, it's it's extreme. Some states require fingerprints uh, on on we're using ink on card. Some require you go to the US to get it done. It's just the amount of regulation is is just extreme, and it's not going away. I mean, California is now coming with its own version of the GDPR, uh, which is even more extreme, uh, and so forth. China, uh, you've got all the regulation about how, how you can run an internet company or not run an internet company. You know, I have a personal belief that Jack Ma sold out of Alibaba because he wants to. Um, he, he just knows the regulations is going to come in. It's going to make it too hard for Alibaba to to, to sell products into the US, etc. So, you know, it's just it's just an incredibly challenging place, particularly because world leaders see technology as one of the limited places that there's growth happening in the world, and so that's a place for taxation revenue. Um, you know, um, and so they you know can be. All and having said that, though, they haven't they haven't been very good at getting tax at taxing a lot of these companies. So I guess they're they're, they're finding it's easy to regulate the tax for some. Well, yes and, and, and no. I mean, it, it all depends. I mean, um, you know, co companies like Google, for example, they employ people in Australia and they pay, you know, for those people pay income taxes and so forth. But, you know, the problem is with this whole fair share taxation system, it's kind of like a modern world version of Ayn Rand, <laughs> um, you know, Atlas Shrugs. I mean, like, it's going to end up with, if you run a global technology company, by definition, anyone can, can just access your website anywhere in the world and buy something. I'll end up filing tax returns in 180 seven countries of the world or whatever the united nations uh, has recognized and it's just a complete the, the overhead to be able to do that is just extreme so it's just at, whereas, whereas it would make a lot more sense to have a some sort of global person global regulator or tax thing where who actually says okay well let's we'll work it out because otherwise you end up with a company saying oh uh, to the you say to the u.s government oh no no i'm going to pay taxes in ireland and the irish company saying no 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 no, i'm going to pay taxes in somewhere else and you know you, you, in the next thing you know they're not paying taxes or not paying enough anywhere whereas if you've got one one regulator that's looking at it and it's much easier for the company and then says splitting the splitting the proceeds so the united, united nations <laughs> uh, you know, we're nowhere near that obviously but you know but it, sounds, it sounds as if things are going to get a lot worse before they they get better on that front. well it's a lot What's the law of unintended consequences? I mean, the Australian government comes along and start, starts wanting to, um, you know, uh, starts the paradigm of, of, of taxing in the, the country that you're selling the products. So of course, everyone else will do that. And it turns out, well, Australia's a pretty small market. So Australian technology companies are going to lose as a result of, of pushing that paradigm mm -hmm. because, you know, we sell, you know, the whole point of building a technology company in Australia is to sell overseas. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know. Yep. So, so I'm I'm taking from this that uh, you're you're seeing very strong demand, basically for, as you say, software is eating the world. So you're not finding any any demand problems uh, anywhere in in various parts of the globe, like slowing or speeding up or or anything. Just I'm I'm in the I'm in the broad categories. I provide freelance.com is a, a global marketplace for jo jobs and 33 million people in that marketplace. We've done 15 million jobs to date projects. So build me a website, design me a logo, whatever it may be. Financial research, copywriting, you name it. Um, you know, the labor. Um, we've got a payments business being escrow for anything that's expensive or complicated. And then we have a freight marketplace called Freightlancer. So we're in the very broad categories of labor, payments, and, and freight, which really help entrepreneurs and commerce you know, transact and, and um, interact around the world. Hmm, okay, sure thing. Well, I, I normally uh, use this time just to sort of wrap up and give you a chance to um, to plug your various business interests, but I feel like you've just done that then, Matt. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Is there some ways that um, our listeners can get in touch with you or any, anything else you'd like to, uh, to pop in? Sure. If you, I guess you haven't read my article. It's on Medium. to search for Matt Barry, B-A-R-R-I-E. I also publish things on LinkedIn occasionally. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, uh, but, you know, I uh, enjoyed very much the conversation with everyone today and uh, obviously an avid uh, reader of macro business. I think in my House of Cards article, I used a bunch of images and a bunch of quotes from uh, from various articles over the years. So um, I very much appreciate it. Did, uh, that's okay, though, because I think we uh, plagiarized your entire article in return. So <laughs> I'm happy with that. <laughs> uh, very good. Well, look, um, yeah, well, thanks again for your time today, Matt. It was fantastic. Uh, great insights there. And we really look forward to getting you on the show uh, sometime soon, mate. So, yeah, thanks. Thank you for having me. Cheers.
So, Damien, uh, 50 odd minutes spent there with Matt Barry, a very smart guy, uh, entrepreneur, and uh, had plenty of insight on the Australian economy and where he thinks we're headed. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, I think um, the key th- there's a couple of couple of key things I brought out. There's obviously a, a lot we we spoke about innovation and 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 education and, and and things like that. I think the the key one for me is that it comes down to our, this core thesis that we have is that the Australian economy um, has been through this massive expansion based on the growth in resources and that then as that boom sort of tailed off uh the rba cut rates and sort of and and the APRA loosened up on lending standards and we basically ended we had blew this big housing bubble so mm. we took and, and matt's pretty much on that same sort of path and and so the idea the question now is so, so the resources booms you know coming to, the, to an end the housing booms coming to an end or, or over the question is what replaces these in terms of the, the Australian economy? What's going to, what's actually going to drive it going forward? And we've had the view for a while that, you know, it does need to be this whole manufacturing IT innovation, you know, a modern economy, move your, move your economy into a modern economy, not one that basically just takes, digs dirt and sells it and, and flogs houses to each other. Mm. Um, the, as, as we heard though, there's no quick fixes. It's not something you can just, you know, you, you, you have your innovation statement by your, your then prime minister who says, we're going to throw all this money at the problem and, and everything will be fixed. And, mm. and here we are two or three years later and, and said, you know, one of our leading uh, tech entrepreneurs isn't quite sure whether there is an innovation minister or not yeah, yeah. at the moment. So, and, and, and also feels like the solution starts at primary school level, which is uh, <laughs> it's a pretty long lead time. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, that all comes back to saying we need a lower dollar. Uh, okay. and, and, and that's, you know, that that's your solution in the end is saying, well, if you drive the Australian dollar down to a level where, um, you know, as Matt said, if you're starting the business again, you wouldn't be starting it in Australia for, for a number of reasons. But, you know, if you get the Australian dollar low enough, people will, you know, mm. we do have an educated workforce and, and although there are problems, um, you know, uh, that, that we ran through, well-educated, um, good rule of law, relatively low on, uh, you know, good, good on corruption mm. um, in a relative sense. And so the idea is that uh, from our perspective is, you know, to, to fix this, you either go through this long period of stagnation or the, the Aussie dollar falls quite rapidly and, and you get the chance to, to regrow and rebuild some of these sectors that, that, that have left that left Australia when the, the, the Australian dollar was so high yep. to, to, to sort of to stop the resources boom. Yep. And so, um, yeah, it keeps coming back to that same, we keep circling back to that same sort of thoughts is that, um, you know, that's the way you need to be positioning your, your portfolio for the longer term is position it for a lower dollar, position it for either stagnation or or or, or a, a recession in the Australian economy before you can get your um, your lift back. Mm. And so practically, how does that sort of play out in our portfolios? So minimum weight Aussie equities, basically. Mm. So, and as we spoke a little bit about it then uh, with, with Matt, but, um, you know, the, the problem very much in the large cap Australian equities is your choices are resources, banks, uh, property related stocks. And now you, once you've done those, there, there isn't much left. Mm. And, and, the, and the ones that are left are often ones like, as you said, technology stocks are actually quite well priced in Australian markets. There's not many in the, uh, in the large cap space, but um, you know, the, the ones that are um, CSL ResMed, um, Cochlear, for example, mm. are, um, or CSL Cochlear, sorry, in, in the large cap space, are a lot more expensive than what you see a lot of their overseas competitors. Like mm. there's some of these things you're paying 30 times earnings to just to get to get a seat at the table. Mm. And so the question comes back to those ones. Look, great businesses, love them at the right prices, more than happy to own them. But do I want to own them at 35, 40 times and without a sort of clear view to the, the next leg of growth and mm. things like that? Saying, well, that's a, um, yeah. So uh, in, in our portfolios, we're, we're tending to find stocks elsewhere. Yep. And, and as the world gets more globalized, I think that's, um, you know, it, it becomes less of a, you get less of risk there. And you also do get the, the extra benefit of if the Aussie dollar falls that you, you pick up the gains on, on currencies as well. Okay, sure thing. All right, very good. Mm-hmm. And on that note. Well, that's it for now. And thanks for watching. If you like what you heard today, and you'd like to hear more, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash subscribe. Give us your email address and in return we'll send you a weekly email with new webinar topics, links for our podcasts and other news from Nucleus Wealth. I certainly hope you've got something out of today as I have and we'll look forward to catching you with the next one. Cheers.